Please welcome panel moderator, Chief Innovation Officer, GE, and CEO, GE Business Innovations, Sue Siegel. <laughs> Good afternoon. <clears throat> um, you know, from the Industrial Revolution to the age of the assembly line, and now we're in the midst of really today's burgeoning digital and 3D manufacturing industry, and you've been hearing about it all day today. Um, the manufacturing industry has always been an incubator for ingenuity. In fact, you might even say manufacturing today is sexy. And who would have said that? I mean, it's leaps and bounds from where the industry looked like 50, 25, or even just 10 years ago. Now, too often the discussion is all about the old line industry struggling to survive in a world of bold new tech. And we know that digital and additive technologies are actually transforming manufacturing. You've seen so much of that talked about, and it's absolutely unleashing productivity. Now, companies all over the world understand that they actually have to integrate these digital capabilities. They have to do it into their operations, and they have to absolutely maximize productivity. So with this, they're also thinking about, of course, their workforce, the future of work. So as we think about this, these are some of the questions we're going to try to address today with our panelists. How will manufacturing job descriptions be different? What type of new skills are needed? How can industry join forces with local government and academia to build a pipeline of workers with the skills they need to be competitive to work in what is tomorrow's factories? So helping us actually address these questions, let me introduce the panelists. Um, first and foremost is Dr. Melva Crawford. She is Associate Dean of Engineering for Research at Purdue University. And this is in Indiana. And just so that you get to know her just a little bit, let me just tell you something that you actually can't Google about her. And that is, she is an absolute cycling aficionado. After she had run so many marathons, she decided something less severe for her feet. And one thing you probably won't know is that her collections of bicycles was actually worth more than my car. And then also joining me is Batter. Al Olama, Batter is CEO of the aerospace division at Mugadala Investment Company in Abu Dhabi. Batter has a distinguished career in aerospace, so you'll be absolutely intrigued to know that he actually suffers from aviophobia. <laughs> Who knows what that is? Fear of flying. Think about that. He's in the aerospace industry. So <clears throat> that gives you a little bit. In fact, I think you're going to Pittsburgh next, right? And it's a by car. By car. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right, so let's get started with the questions, Melba. This one's coming to you first. As the educator here, do you think the next generation of workers are actually prepared for advanced manufacturing? And how have you and your colleagues at Purdue started to look to incorporate new technologies into the curriculum? <clears throat> so I think that uh, at one level, I think that uh, people are being prepared, well prepared at the university level. Um, but I think that there is a major gap, and I think that is particularly related to the people on the shop floor. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we really need to pay a lot more attention to that as, as we move forward with this technology. So at Purdue, um, I would say that additive manufacturing was really incorporated first in like the senior design programs, where you have a fairly short period of time. The team needs to design something, uh, build it, test it, um, and evaluate it. Um, but it's really been infused much um, deeper into the curriculum, yep. much earlier, and I think that that's um, more transformative. You know, how many of us did free body diagrams? Or then, you know, after the uh, um, computing became much more uh, available to people, then you could do simulation. But this allows you to uh, close the loop. You can not only, you know, conceive, you can design, you can build it, you can test it, and then you have that feedback loop. And I think that's really uh, important. The other thing that um, is perhaps even more disruptive is the engagement at the early levels, not only at the university, but through K through 12. You know, students, are, part of our job is to, to teach technology and engineering to teach fundamentals, but another part's to inspire, inspire that next generation of scientists and engineers. 
and students are really inspired by the capability to, um, to, to build things. You know, Lego was transformative, but additive manufacturing is now being incorporated in a lot of the classrooms, and, um, and I think it's, you know, if you're unfettered by self-doubt, um, you think in terms of an objective you want to create, you know, achieve, but you don't think in necessarily in terms of the constraints, and, and this kind of technology really facilitates that, uh, facilitates creativity, and I, I think that's where actually in education some of the biggest impact will be. Yeah, and at the younger ages, it really does make it a lot more fun if you're incorporating it into the day-to-day. Bader, what can we do as business leaders actually to integrate new technologies much more successfully in our day-to-day -day work streams and train our workers accordingly? I mean, when, um, when you think about additive and what it can do to a workplace, it can actually revolutionize the way that you, you perform on a day-to-day. -day. And, and the key thing there is to be able to get the, the younger workforce to accept this. So I've been fortunate, right, in my manufacturing facility, the one that I used to run, which used to make aircraft parts, by the way, um, I have 50% of the people that would tell you exactly how you'd need to, what you need to do to build a part, and the remaining 50% that would be asking the questions, why do we need to do it that way or that specific way? And blending that kind of uh, mindsets in an environment is, is very productive. So from our perspective, we encourage questions, we encourage people to come and ask, you know, how could they do things better, quicker, faster, and cheaper so that we can ultimately deliver a result back to the customer. Thank you. And, and what is one benefit or advantage that additive manufacturing will actually provide that we haven't heard this morning, that people that aren't in the industry might actually go, hmm, how do you think about that? Bader, you want to take that first? Sure. I mean, um, think about it. Uh, inclusive, uh, inclusivity, right? Uh, it, is, it doesn't care about gender. It doesn't care about geography. It doesn't care about uh, age. It doesn't care about nationality. Uh, anybody who's smart enough to use a 3D printer is qualified to add value to the process. Hmm. So I think that's the unique thing. Democratization. Yes. Very interesting. Melba? <clears throat> so I think that uh, sort of adding to that, you know, there's a whole market out there, if you want to even call it a market, um, in terms of scale, because um, I deal with nonprofits as well as, as companies, and, and it's great to see a lot of the, the people here that you know, we engage with at Purdue and engineering as well. Um, but nonprofits are thinking many times in terms of global deployment at low cost. Um, you know, we think of, of the high-end biomedical devices. There's also a huge need for um, biomedical devices, all kinds of, of technologies that could be used in developing countries. Mm -hmm. And they need to be uh, deployed uh, with more personal kind of uh, uh, design, and that's not possible now uh, with, with traditional manufacturing. Uh, they need to be many times uh, in a very short period of time. And so I think that you know, that whole mission uh, is going to be totally transformed, as well as you know, infrastructure. I just mentioned the biomedical end of things, but infrastructure, um, both permanent infrastructure and short-term infrastructure that you know, is going to need to be um, developed in terms of response to disasters, to all kinds of, of uh, situations. And so I think this, this technology is going to provide all kinds of things that, you know, it's like GPS. It was designed and you know, the satellites were launched for one purpose, but once it became accessible to people, then you know, the applications just really um, were, they, it just spawned all kinds of applications. So I think that's gonna be the sort of thing that, that happens here as it's, because it is accessible, as Bader said. You know, I don't know how many of you guys, <clears throat> excuse my voice, I've been losing it, um, have, have seen the 3D manufactured houses have any of you seen that on TV? In 24 hours, it costs them less than $10,000 to actually build a house, to, to your point on infrastructure. Exactly. And for crisis management in particular, people believe this has to happen, not to mention to provide affordable housing. So there's so many different applications that we actually haven't even thought about, and they just do it right there. We had a company that we invested in in, in, in GE Ventures that also did um, a 3D manufactured car on the floor of the manufacturing summit in Chicago a couple of years ago. And they said they'd do it, and at that time, in about a seven day period or a little bit less than that, and they would drive it off the floor. 
Well, you know what? They did. So they made us all sort of go, OK, <laughs> this is real. Um, let's talk a little bit about what, at, what other technologies like additive manufacturing, who else is going to be disrupted in this field, um, Bader, as you think about this? <clears throat> I mean, the, the unique thing about additive is that you're reshaping business models. It's not about the technology as much as the business model is evolving, right? And, and when I think of companies like, in my part of the world, DP World, Dubai Ports, and you think about Dubai Ports making all these sort of huge investments in infrastructure all around the world, just trying to be more competitive and moving sh and shipping things around. I mean, with additive, the future of shipping, in my opinion, is just the flow of data, right? If I wanted, a, I wanted a, a table, I wanted a, 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 I wanted a chair, I wanted a specific part, I should be able to print it on demand, provided I get the data. So I think companies such as port companies that do logistics, 3PLs, they're going to be, in my opinion, disrupted by the evolution that's going to come in, in, in additive. I think it's, it was to your point before, right, that we just don't know. We don't know. And, you know, in addition to companies, it's going to have a huge impact and already is on education. Um, as we think about distance education now, you know, we've come from it being a totally dry kind of, of delivery to being a little more engaging. But to have capability on the other end to actually develop and produce some of what you're talking about in the classroom, then it's making distance education uh, incorporating laboratories viable for the first time. And I think that, uh, that that's going to you know, be a huge impact internationally. So, Bader, um, let's touch on the global aspect of innovation. You know, as the leader of the Global Manufacturing Industrialization Summit, which countries do you think, based on your purview right now, are best at embracing the industrial revolution and actually addressing this, those challenges that are incorporated into it, particularly the skills gap? I mean, when we started this uh, Global Manufacturing Summit and we wanted to hold the first one in Abu Dhabi, um, a lot of people personally ask me, say, you know, why Abu Dhabi, why the UAE? You're not Germany, you're not the US, you're not China, you're not India. So why Abu Dhabi and what do you have to do with manufacturing? I think, you know, if, if people take a step back and you look at smaller countries, you need to be adaptable, flexible, and fast when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution. And it's no longer a big country game. It's not size, it's more adaptability, flexibility, and being quick. Right? The only challenge I do see with smaller countries like Singapore, the UAE, and anybody, anywhere else is the fact that you don't have a population of smart people. 1% of you know, the top engineers in China is very different from the 1% of top engineers in the United Arab Emirates. You're talking about Just a, a little. complete difference. <laughs> yeah. And that's the challenge. But I think you know, Abu Dhabi offers a unique opportunity is that we are in the middle of the world. We are in the middle of the East and West. And it's not about the flow of goods. It's more about the flow of people. To be able to attract the minds in one place to make a difference to the world, I think smaller countries offer a better advantage than, than larger ones. Thank you. Melba, any insights into who's educating best around the world and who's thinking about this? Well, I think we're all thinking about it, but I think in this context that one of the things that's uh, going to be particularly important because it has to happen very quickly is a much stronger connection between industry and the universities. And, you know, that's, uh, you know, research level universities, that's totally teaching um, institutions um, and, and of, of all sorts because you, you can't within our domain, you cannot you, you teach fundamentals. We do research, in a, a, typically at a fairly fundamental level. But in terms of deploying technology, that's done much better by companies. And so we really need that engagement in order to actually be relevant and in order to move um, forward with our, our teaching uh, of the next generation, for sure. You know, and this kind of skill set in particular, I wonder how much is at the community college level, the vocational level? versus at the highest levels of university. I'm curious if you have some thoughts on that. Well, I think there's a place for you know, everyone. Um, I think that certainly in terms of being able to deploy um, uh, ad to advance the, the training for people who are on the shop floor, then community colleges that are much closer a lot of times to the companies. Um, it's sort of like an agriculture with extension, where you're, you're much closer to the user. 
And mm. I think that that's very important. But then the universities also have to be very much, uh, the research level one universities, much more engaged with those um, community colleges. And I'm seeing that now on a number of large projects where we are partnering um, with community college, with vocational schools, even with high schools, and um, in, in terms of the educational component. So I, I think, as I said, there's a place for everybody. Thank you. All right, lightning round. We're going to run out of time here. Name one new skill you think will be a must-have for manufacturers in the next 10 years. I mean, I'll be provocative, right? I don't think you need a university degree anymore to be in the next generation of, uh, of manufacturing. I think we, we have to accept the fact that anyone can become a manufacturer, even a child, you know, when you consider that there's no, there's no going to be a restriction on age. But the one thing that I would look for in, in my workforce for the manufacturing of the future is a person that can demonstrate curiosity. Somebody who is curious about the way things are done and why they can be done in a different way. That's the skill set that you need for someone who's going to be working on a 3D printer, thinking in abstract. That's great. Nala? I think that, uh, you know, that coupled with um, flexibility, uh, companies need to be flexible with their workers. They need to be flexible in terms of, of, of change. And, uh, and that's hard. But I think that uh, additive manufacturing is going to contribute to that because in a transformative way, you can be much you can be more reactive in a shorter period of time at a less lower cost. So I think that, uh, um, you know, that kind of general skill is something that will continue to be and even more so important in this domain. Okay. And what's one word to describe the potential of additive manufacturing? One. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, everybody's spoken about this today all day long, right? So I, the disruptive nature of it is, is the one that probably excites me the most. And, and I want to say something, so just, just in terms of, of when people, because a lot of, as a business leader, we all look at cost and we all make assessments on business cases. I think the unique thing about additive is we don't compare apples for apples. When we want to compare a business case with additive, we should consider it whether I want to spend a hell lot, a lot of money in building a factory or I would like to replace that with a 3D printer, right? Whether it was for flexing or, or uh, flexing production or doing something, it's the upfront investment as opposed to thinking about it retrospectively and trying to integrate it into my operations. That's when it makes a lot of difficulties in trying to make a business case out of it. So true, so true. Okay, Melba, so, he's not a rule follower, so one word. <laughs> You're not going to be a It depends on the context. <laughs> on the context of, of all of us here, I think it's a game changer. Yeah. In the context of society, I think it's worrisome. Um, I think people are, are concerned uh, about displacement of workers. And I think it's up to all of us to, um, to make sure that it's clear that humans still need to be in the loop. And, and we need to find ways to do that because uh, advancing this technology and, and improving on it is going to happen so much faster and so much better if we continue to have humans engaged. Thank you. So knowing that I, we are standing in between you and lunch, let me close it out now. And that is that there is no doubt that job descriptions are going to change and that as minds and machines actually work side by side, there is a responsibility by all sectors, be it the private sector, the public sector, and academia, to actually work together to close the skills gap. We understand that. You know, at GE, let me just tell you very quickly, we're actively investing in developing the workforce of the future, and we're doing this through training or attracting new talent and encouraging innovation across our global workforce. Let me give you a sense of this. Last year, we announced Brilliant Learning. Some of you might have heard of that, but this is a skills curriculum to train global supply chain and manufacturing employees for new high, highly valuable jobs. And the focus has been around lean, advanced, additive, and digital manufacturing. In addition to that, through the GE Foundation, we've worked very closely, as you suggested, both for government and the education sector, particularly at the high school level, to uh, partner on STEM education initiatives. So manufacturing has and will continue to be an incubator for ingenuity and innovation. And as I mentioned before, it's now become quite sexy. And there is a lot for us to have to embrace to actually change, to make the change required happen. But those that will grab hold of it, I think will find themselves in this extraordinarily bold 
and exciting time that will unlock the productivity that I believe all nations are seeking. So with that, this is the new manufacturing. Thank you for your time. Applause for the panelists. Thank you.